Hi and welcome to the Shadow Studio 3 Quick Start Guide. The purpose of this tutorial is to get you up and running as quickly as possible. So without further ado, we drag the plugin onto a layer and we've got a shadow. The different light types we have. Directional, you can think of this as say the sun. The shadows are all parallel to each other and you control it with an angle parameter. A point light instead is you control the point light. Think of it as say a lamp and you control where the point is and the shadows sort of expand out of there. They are not parallel. Now, to change the size of the point light, we have this light radius parameter here. You can also change it by dragging the user interface scale here. And this is just to help you visualize how big your light is. The bigger the light, the softer the shadows will be. So in point light, it's called a light radius. In the directional light, it's called light softness and it's a percentage. We also have a shadow length. You can keyframe this. You can also keyframe it from positive to negative. We also have inverse shadows, which on a directional shadow just simply swaps the direction that the light's coming from. However, in point mode, uh, this is much more special. If we change the light radius to zero, this will help us visualize it, but we can inverse the shadow and we can also check auto shadow length here and I'll crank up the opacity end to 100%. And now our shadows disappear into this vanishing point. The auto shadow length here is just a convenient slider so you don't have to manually calculate how far the shadow ought to be for it to converge at the point. We also have inner shadows. That is the same for point lights and directional lights, which is really cool. Inner shadows have a blending mode, which you can choose from here. We have all the default After Effects blending modes and I will click Reset Style. Let's move on to Opacity and Color. For ray tracing, you won't really need to change the opacity start and end unless you wanna create, say, the long shadow look. Uh, to get realistic results, I would generally keep them at 100 and zero. If you want to, say, increase the intensity of your shadow, you can increase the shadow length. That will increase the amount of shadows that accumulate. And if you want to make the shadow more subtle, you can come down to easing and increase the opacity easing. You can also change the softness easing. A value of zero means that there will be no softness at all. And a value of 100% will mean the softness ramps up much faster than usual. Now, in terms of fill mode, we have solid fill, which we're currently using, or we have a gradient fill. We have a really handy and intuitive gradient editor here. Simply click to add a point, double click to change the color. You can dial in the exact position on the gradient that you want here with this slider. You can remove interpolation. I'll just remove the softness to help visualize that. We can reset things. We can change the gamma from gamma one to 2.2, but generally you won't want a gamma of 2.2. In some circumstances, it can look ugly. You can also shift these points around. That's really handy for look dev to rapidly see how the result would look if the same colors were just in a different order, or you could flip the order by clicking on the reverse button. You can also use this cycle gradient to cycle all the points along the gradient editor. So what I'll do is I'll just shuffle these over and add another red point. And what this will allow me to do is to seamlessly loop the colors of the gradient. And the only reason that the loop is seamless is because the start and end have the same color of red. If you want to use this fill influence here, you'll want to change the renderer back to the standard renderer, which at these current settings looks abysmal but essentially the standard renderer is Shadow Studio 2 that's been improved and ported as the standard renderer. Now what's cool about the standard renderer is that we can use the color values of our source layer to cast the shadow. At the moment that would be quite boring because it's white, but I will just add a gradient ramp, set that to say red and blue, and put that before Shadow Studio. Now nothing's really happening here, but this slider is a value from zero to 100%. And at 100%, we will only see either our solid or gradient fill. And at 0%, the shadow will be cast using only the colors from the source layer, which is cool. And then a value in between will mix that with your fill mode. This style is really handy for creating the long source effect, which is kind of derpy, but cool. And then you can also use it to emulate glossy reflections, such as in the glossy reflection preset. I'm just gonna change the style back to normal and remove this gradient. Oh, and I forgot to mention that in terms of your gradient fill, you can also choose to ramp all these gradient points based on the ease gradient. So a value of zero is perfectly linear 
and a value of 100% uses exponential easing. This is handy so that you can ramp all points. Just say you had eight points and you didn't want to sort of ease them manually and change their location. You can change easing with just a single slider. Now let's come down to texture and this allows us to add a texture to our shadow. I'm going to create a new layer and let's add a fractal noise to this. I'm going to go transform, make it quite small and make it quite dark. Let's call this our texture layer. And in Shadow Studio, let's choose that layer and I'll turn off the texture. And if we zoom in here, nothing's happening because we need to inherit the effects and masks because the texture is being driven by our fractal noise effect. Now we're getting a warning here, both layers need continuous rasterization for correct behavior. So we can just tick that here to make that warning go away. If you know what you're doing and you don't want either of your layers to be continuously rasterized and you don't want that warning to show up, that's fine. You can come down to about and support and click hide warnings and it will be hidden. Now to see what's going on, I'm gonna turn off my background layer and view the alpha of our shadow with our texture. The default blend mode is Silhouette Luma, which works in our case because the fractal noise effect is actually not generating an alpha. If you set this to Silhouette Alpha, nothing would happen at all. However, if your texture is based on the alpha channel, you'll want this mode here, but otherwise I'm gonna use Silhouette Luma. Now we have a strength slider here, so zero means that there is no opacity when we composite the texture with our shadow. The alpha bias parameter here allows us to control the intensity of the texture in areas of the shadow that are fully opaque. So if we lower this value, we will see that the texture gets stronger in fully opaque areas. The matte gamma does essentially the opposite and it will increase the visual intensity of the texture in areas of the shadow that are transparent. And if I increase the shadow softness, we can see the difference that the matte gamma value of 1.5 versus one makes to our result. Let's get out of the alpha channel here and the view texture button is handy for essentially viewing what the plugin is interpreting the texture as. So if you figure, oh, that doesn't look right, click the view texture button and then compare it with your current texture. And if there's a difference, then it means that the maybe you're not inheriting the effects, just say you're inheriting the source. And then we go, oh, well, the texture layer looks completely different from what the plugin sees. So something must be wrong. That's a handy debugging tool. Now, moving on to quality, we have some handy quality presets here. To help us view that, I will change the source opacity to zero. Now we're not compositing the source, we're just seeing the shadow itself. And we can see the difference that draft versus say high makes to the quality of the shadow. We also have this alpha threshold value, and essentially this is a threshold for which pixels will cast a shadow. Any pixels with an alpha value below of 0.75 will not contribute a shadow. This is a pretty much a sweet spot, and I don't recommend you change this value, but if you were to say increase that to a value of one, you would get a bunch of ugly stair stepping because now only the fully opaque pixels are casting a shadow, and that is prone to aliasing. I'll reset that. If we were using the standard renderer, we no longer have an alpha threshold parameter, we now have a samples parameter. And if I were to say, reduce the light radius to zero, we might see, ah, we can see each individual sample, so 36 samples wouldn't be enough, maybe we need 200 samples. Note that the more samples you generate, the more times you're essentially compositing the layer on top of itself, and so the opacity will increase. So you might want to lower it as you increase your sample amount. But in standard renderer, you also have these quality presets and they behave pretty much the same. Back to the compositing tab, we have a source blend mode, which is essentially if you have the source opacity set to above zero, by default, the plugin is compositing the source layer onto the shadow using a normal blend mode, which means it appears above. We can have some fun with this, say if we were to silhouette alpha and that would silhouette the input from the shadow and there are a bunch of other creative ones to be found. Now, of course, if you were doing an inner shadow, you wouldn't have that option because the shadow needs to be composited inside the input and therefore the input actually needs to be present. You can't change the source opacity and you don't define the blend mode here. You define it up here because we thought you're probably going to need handy access to this inner blend mode if you're using that. Shadow opacity is a global opacity slider. Note this is not the same as opacity start and end, it's just a multiplier. Shadow offset is very handy. You'll generally want to keep it at the default value. You can increase it to offset the shadow in the direction that you're going. So for example, in a directional shadow, this offsets using a translate. If you're using a point shadow, this offsets using a scale as a percentage. 
And essentially what that fixes is if we set this to zero, we can kind of see the shadow bunching up with the source and it's creating a little bit of aliasing here. If we turn the background layer on, it's a bit more obvious. Whereas if we increase it to a value of one, that gets rid of that and we have nice clean edges. The buffer expansion parameter you should never need. You needed to use it often in Shadow Studio 2 as your shadow or layer might get clipped off, but we've improved the algorithm greatly so you should never need this. However, if you do find that either the shadow or the source layer is getting clipped, you can increase that value there which should fix it, but that's considered a bug so please report that to us. Finally, we have the about and support tab here. If you have any issues with the plugin, please screenshot this before sending it so we know details about your system. You can submit a support ticket by clicking get support. We've also prepared a very comprehensive wiki page. This video sort of glossed over a bunch of things. So if you want to learn more information about certain parameters, what they do, the wiki covers every single parameter and what they do, what they're used for. And it also includes a bunch of practical examples and best practices, which are really handy for your everyday use. Other than that, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I really hope you enjoy using Shadow Studio 3. Available now at